so I said this in the, the intro. Um, I teased it, I should say. That's what we call it in this business, is that the first time I ever met you, Rhapsody, you literally gave me the shirt off your back, or rather the jacket off your back. I don't want jacket. people to think you were out here brawless or out here with your bra out or something, but it was at a Grammys party and um, I think it was Ninth that introduced us. Yeah, yeah, Ninth, Ninth Wonder, mm -hmm. the producer extraordinaire, who also a future guest on this podcast. I taped a podcast with him not too long ago. And um, you had on this Colin Kaepernick fatigue jacket that was out cold. Yes. I was like, damn, where'd you get that jacket? <laughs> and you were like, you can have it. I'm like, no, but yes. But I had no. to. You had to have it. That was so like, amazing. I was like, she ain't know me from a can of paint. That's I, that Southern hospitality. I had met you, but I know you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I feel like I knew you. Yeah. And it was, um, that was really one of the nicest things that a, a little, almost a stranger has ever done. And then you follow that up by really um, giving me the big head by dropping my name <laughs> in a lyric and Nina on your Project Eve, which um, I know I'm not the only one to say it because I, I certainly read a lot of the reviews, but it's, to me, it, it was the best hip hop album of 2019. And oh, thank you. Um, if somebody put you in the top three, you wouldn't be three. <laughs> it was me, come on, give me some love. Uh, no, I'm giving you Thank all you. the love, no, giving you your you. flowers right now. <laughs> um, but just let's talk about Eve, though, because that's such a unique project to create where you have all these songs. What is it, 12? 14? 16. 16, okay. Yes. Um, 16 songs, all named after different black women who um, I assume you obviously admire. So what made you decide to essentially write a love letter to black women? Um, I did an interview. I think, you know, throughout my career, and if you go back to my projects, like you'll get an interlude here. I might name a bunch of black women. You know, a song here, Betty Shabazz. But um, it was a summer, what's this year? 20, 2020. 20, yeah, 2020. Summer 2018. Okay. You know, time don't exist no more to us. <laughs> it's but, all about um, yeah. I was doing an interview for Layla's Wisdom. And Lamar uh, was the name of the guy that interviewed me, and he was doing a like family tree, a lineage of the female artists. So he uh, he started with Roberta Flack and Nina Simone. He kind of connected it to me, and I was I was like, bro, I don't, I don't even see how that connect. But he was like, nah, you gotta understand, like both of y'all have crazy pens. You write about you know what's true for the time is soulful, uh, and I was like, all right, I see where you're going. So we did the interview. We spent the all day together, and I went home, and it, the seed was just planted, right? So um, I recorded this song that I had been wanting to do forever, but I just I never approached it right, and I did Aaliyah first because I wanted to do a song about a tomboy. And when I was thinking of titles, I was just like, I'm going to just call it Aaliyah. And once I did that, it was like everything connected. So it was just like, yo, you could do a Felicia Rashad talk about you know motherhood and I'll have kids, but I got this motherly side of me and you could do a song about you know Whoopi and be creative with it. And it was just like my mind just exploded with ideas. So that's kind of where it started. But he really planted the seed and just making that family tree. And it's just like, man, my family tree is a lot of branches and they all different. And it was also a way for me to show different sides of me because people like to box me in as, you know, we know you're lyrical, you're smart, whoop de whoop but, you know, I'm goofy and I like to have fun, too. We've been laughing since I walked in. <laughs> but, you know, um, there's just different sides of me, and I thought it was a creative way through the music to show love to women but also show different sides of who I am. Did so. you consider the project at all? Because it is, you know, that's something real cerebral to think about, to bring to hip-hop. Did you, um, was there any concern or were you a little nervous about how people might receive something like that? Uh, Nah, not at all. You know, you go through your mind like, <clears throat> what about, you know, the non-black fan base that I have? How are they going to feel? Are they going to feel like, you know, oh, all women should be celebrated or, you know, as as white young men, it's like, I can't even relate to this. I don't even know if I want to listen to Somebody's it. Somebody's going to all lives matter. You, you know <laughs> what I'm saying? Like, all right. lives matter. And I was like, I don't want to hear a project that have created the black women. I, can't, I know I can't relate to this. Um, but I said, you know, I, I went back to my favorite Nina Simone quote, and it's just like it's an artist's duty to reflect the times and just, to, you know, create how you want to create, tell your stories. And it's like I make music for who I make music for. You know, it's important for me to tell these stories and highlight black women and to show that, you know, we aren't monolith, that we're all different. I was thinking about a time I went to Africa. Now, it was my first time going. I was so excited to go. Knife was like, he went. And he was like, I, I get the customs, and they tell me, welcome home, right? 
And I was like, yo, that's deep. So my first time going, I get my passport. And they was like, let me ask you a question. I was like, what's up? And she says, um, Are all the all the black women in America like the women on Love and Hip Hop? And I was just like, you know. And, and, and so it was just like, yo, it's just so much I could talk about and about us and tell our stories and stories that we don't necessarily get to tell a lot. So, I, you know, I, I was just like, what makes you a great artist is, you know, doing what feels right for you in that moment. And it's just like you can't overthink what – you know, people might want or what's good for Billboard. You just got to do art. Like that would make that's what makes the be- best art, and that's where I was in that moment of time. So that's what I wanted to talk about. So how did you narrow it down to these to this sixteen songs? Because I read that you actually cut over forty, 40. songs, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So it's some people out there on the cutting room floor. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, I got some maxi waters. I did Keisha for Belly. Uh, well, I you did, did Keisha from Belly? Yeah, I did a Keisha <laughs> from Belly. Um, you got, you got to do Pam you done from a Martin. double disc. <laughs> I thought about it. That was the original idea. I wanted to do like a part A and part B. Mm. So how we did it is we did it off Sonics. You know what I'm saying? At first I went in. I was like, I got to have a Lauren. I got to have Cicely Tyson. I have to have this person. And you put the music together and it's like, these songs are dope, but they're not dope together. Like they, they don't flow. And that's big for us. Like, you know, Knife says when he creates an album, he doesn't like a party. Like, it's got to have a story. So there was three songs that we, you know, built around. Um, we built around Sojourner, um, Oprah, and Serena. So, you know, what sonically meshes good with those. And they have this type of energy to them um, and frequency to them. And then, you know, there were songs that fit together that did make the album, but they were more... They were more like soulful and boom bap and more laid back. Those were Felicia, Rashad, uh, DJ Spinderella. Um, so I, it was going to be like, yo, this is Rhapsody Experiment. And like people know like I'm lyrical and, you know, I like soulful beats. But, you know, I got Serena, Oprah. So I was like, this is me showing like, you know, there's more sides of me. And this is this other album would be the root of me. But I never got to the other one. Oh. So, so what do you plan to do with the the extras? I can't really say right now, but they will come out eventually. Okay. Yeah. I'm working on on the follow-up to Eve. So what was the most difficult song to leave off the album? Uh, That's tough. They like a good three or four that were like real hard. Um, One is Asada Shakur. I wanted that one bad, and, and Soundwave produced it, and I've been wanting to work with Soundwave forever. Um, but where we had it placed, it was just like, ah, it's, it's still not feeling like if, if six thousand, like a sore thumb though, it's dope. So we left that one off that I really wanted. There was another one called Zane after the writer. Um, it was a hook thing. Originally, um, there was a producer that produced it and he had a hook from Sid and I was, I wrote to him and I thought, I thought she was going to love the record. She got, she got it back and I think she said, um, that's not the original beat I sung it to, so nah, you can't use it. <laughs> I was like, dang, said, uh, which is cool, you know. As artists, you know, you 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 get married to something and it just feels right to you. So we didn't use that one. Those are probably the two biggest. Ones. Oh, there was one more um, that I did for South Africa because I have a big South African fan base, and I called it um, Miriam at the Miriam Makiba. So those were the three that were hard to, to leave off. They were the last three we took off. So uh, have any of the women that you did songs and tribute to uh, on your album. Have they reached out or have you gotten mm-hmm. word about their feedback oh, and, yeah. and who did? Um, Whoopi. Whoopi hit back. I love Whoopi. I was watching Ghost yesterday. Uh, you in danger, Bay girl. Brown. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she Molly, said, you, you in danger, danger. girl. <laughs> Yo, my homegirl um, did me that same same quote. She's like, Molly, you in danger, girl. <laughs> That's the one. So Whoopi, um, she reached out through her assistant through email and she sent me these fly chocolates like it was a box it was four levels i never seen chocolates so beautiful they were painted all different colors and, and paint specks and did I you actually like, eat them or just stare it at took them? me like two or three <laughs> days i was like i gotta eat them and they tasted bang it <laughs> she probably spent some money on them chocolates nah but they was dope um tyra banks she reached out we actually sat down and have a had a meeting um, to think about like creative ideas that she wanted to you do. So that was really dope meeting her. Um, who am I forgetting? Uh, that's all that's coming to me. I feel like I met more though. All right, no, nothing from Oprah? 
Nah, man, Oprah, she not rocking with it. I had to think about it, Oprah. <laughs> she may not know. She may not know. She know. may not know. Uh, nah, she hadn't reached out yet. Nah, I'm going to say yet. We'll put it in the atmosphere. That's right. Put it in the atmosphere. Yeah. She'll, she'll reach out. Um, um, I was hoping that Serena would, uh, yeah. would dance to the joint. <laughs> So I'm still waiting on that one. She focused right now. She got a win, win, win. Right. Um, but yeah, let me think. Yeah, those those are the two. The Affini, the Affini Estate. Um, they show love. So um, that was that was dope. I'm I'm mad I never got to meet her. But the Grammys I went for to Pimple Butterfly. She sent a message to me because I wore a Tupac T-shirt to the Grammys. And um, I, I think it was something, I have it saved, but it was something like, thank you for continuing my son's legacy or something. So I was like, wow. When I got that message, I was like, wow. <laughs> but um, yeah. It, well, a, a lot of people, um, they may look at your success as sudden, but you have been grinding for a long time. I mean, mm-hmm. as you you know, you mentioned Layla's Wisdom, um, uh, as, as good as, you know, this album is, that one you received uh, a couple Grammy nominations for. So I saw your post when the Grammy nominations came out, and I mm-hmm. was stunned that Eve did not get nominated. So um, how did that that make you feel to not get that nomination? In that, in that moment, like that day, I was heated. You know what I'm saying? I was like, what? <laughs> you know, um, that... There were, you know, when I when I speak about myself and my work, I never go into anything with any expectations ever. Like whatever comes, I'm thankful for. I take it. But I think for this particular record, like, you know, I feel like the the impact that it had and how hard we worked on it, how proud I was of, of growth, and I honestly do think it it was the best, if not one of the best, to come out that year. I was like, I felt like we deserved that one. But I, I, you know, I allowed myself 24 hours and I had to check myself. And it's just like, you don't do it for this. You know, you do it for the, the people and, and the people that connect with it. And you didn't come in it. Like, when I came in the game, it was never like I wanted 15 Grammys. You know what I'm saying? When I got Grammy nominated for Layla's Wisdom, that was the first time I'd ever been acknowledged for any award. Like, I had no BET awards, no NCAA, like nothing. That was the first time. So... You get that feeling and it feels good and you want to feel it again, but you got to tell yourself and remember what you do it for. So, you know, but at first I was, you know, I was heated. I was like, man, politics as usual. But, you know, um, I, I I got no no hate for the Grammys at all because um, I really do think they're trying to do the best that they can. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of dope music came out that year. So, you know. Well, we'll hate on your behalf. So, <laughs> look, I, I didn't realize this till I, I did a, a podcast with Snoop that he's never won a Grammy either. That's crazy, right? Yeah, which is crazy, right? But when you look down the list of some of the best to ever do it, a lot of them haven't. Not, not us. Yes, not, not us. us. Right. So, so you can, you're in good company. <laughs> right. Right. I guess you I was like, rap is okay. Michael Jackson didn't get one for Off the Wall. And I was like, you're right. I'm good. <laughs> So, See what I'm saying? You put it in perspective. So yeah, that's that's why I had to go back to. It's like for us, the culture defines that for us. You know what I'm saying? So you know, if it comes, it comes. If it don't, as long as the people rock with it, I'm I'm good. Well, the Grammys may not have um, given that particular validation, but Cardi B did. Oh yes, that's <laughs> my girl. B, Cardi B <laughs> validated, and she really. Um, and I'm sure, I, I guess I had to, I, I had to ask you, like, I don't know if you saw this coming at all or knew that she was going to say this, but she, um, she wrote pretty hard for you and yeah. talking about how, um, you and, and listing other rappers that need to be supported, female rappers. And, you know, she was, she kept it really not just a hundred, but a thousand about mm-hmm. how sometimes, um, you know, artists are not supported and how she just raps about what she knows about. Mm-hmm. So when Cardi B said that, um, what did you think? Man, um, I thought, I just thought it was dope. You know, you know what I mean? Like it was the second time she is, the first time she did it was via Twitter. Um, she had tweeted about my project and I, that's when, that's the first time I was like, Oh, Cardi listening. Okay. Um, and I had to remember where she was from. She from the Bronx. So, you know, she 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 up on her hip hop. But um when she when she did that, you know, and shouted me out and you la I would say the last what is it, since fifteen years or so, you haven't really gotten a female that's at the forefront of hip hop that's done that. A lot of times, you know, they expect us all to, you know, fight for one spot and like we can't show love for each other. So 
it made me happy and proud for her because of one of her success and her talent and being a great entertainer, but to take her position and she's doing it the right way to be a leader. Like, man, I was like, wow, like it made me feel good. And it, it made you make you feel like, man, it really is a sisterhood. And, you know, we, we're not this false narrative. And, it, you know, I, it just made me like, it just made me happy and proud too that, that it's like, it shows that we, we can listen to more than one thing. You know what I mean? Like, she kind of brought balance to us. Like, yeah, I make I make this music for the club and, you know, for my girls that, you know, swing on poles or whatever they want to do. But I also listen to rap scene and I also listen to Chica and Tierra Whack. So, you know, it just, it just shows. Because a lot of times people don't think that you can listen to those things. You know, somebody said, one of my fans said in the most poetic way, just like, I, I drink water and wine. You know what I'm saying? Like, Coke 45 and, and uh, Incense. That's an Erica Badu joint. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, it. I just felt all good emotions for multiple reasons. Um, you know, just to get that acknowledgement when you're fighting so hard from another female. Um, proud of Cardi because, you know, she's really fallen to her leadership road. And, you know, I just know she's going to continue to do amazing things. And I, I love seeing women win. You know, and I, I love her energy. Um and she kept it a buck fifty, you know. Um, and two, you know, again, it just shows the sisterhood and gives balance. So, yeah. I had a uh, Trina as a guest um, recently, and she talked about how the industry really discriminates against female rappers. She mm-hmm. was saying, for example, that there's a reason why you don't see, you know, multiple female hip hop artists on tour together because they don't want to spend the money because they know if we have Rhapsody, Cardi B, Trina. They all got glam teams. They all got to have stylists. They all got to have all these additional expenses. And it's really a shame because I think um, that would be such a significant moment if that were able to happen. It's not like it's never happened. There's certainly been been a few female tours here and there. Um, what have been, I know you've been, been with Ninth and, and you're in a great situation, but just maybe outside of, of your bubble, what have sort of been some of your experiences in terms of, you know, seeing um, or witnessing some of that discrimination that female rappers have to deal with. Man, um, let me let me think because my experience is is different. Being the fact that I am under ninth and Rock Nation, and they they not too far apart. You know, um, and both really being of the culture and just being about the art, man, woman, it don't matter. So my experience has been a little different. But, you know, uh, you hear stories, too, you know, uh, getting smaller budgets. You know, even with even at Rock Nation, like, I'll send in my, um, I'm working with Misa now, so I'll send in my style. Oh, I know budget. that bill is nice. <laughs> <laughs> Misa show a little love to me. <laughs> um, you know, and, you know, just making sure, like, that, again, you have budgets for that because it is added expense, glam, hair. But it's like, we wouldn't have to do that if men didn't want to see that. You know what I'm saying? Like, so, you know, it's like the the little monster that you created on your own. Like, you know, we, we just we just filling it out of, of what the world likes to see. And and all of the time that ain't it. Some some women just like to feel good and and that's that ain't nothing wrong with that. But um it's that it's you know, just being respected for your craft, um, and your art. Uh I don't I the most thing I've seen is the respect, like Women don't get the same respect as guys. You know, it's it's just looked at as, oh, what you look like, what you dress like, you know. And it's not about the fact that you really can impact because you dope as an artist. Like, that's the biggest thing I think that I've had to go through. And, you know, seeing, you know, with uh, with some of my peers that are, you know, just as talented. Um, but, you know, the other things that I hear stories about, you know, having, feeling like you, you got to do something sexually to get to the top or, you know, I, I don't know those stories. Um, I just know of a lot of women just busting their butts to get there. So I wish I could speak on that more. Well, do but. you, um, was there any pressure um, or did you ever feel any pressure to have a certain image when you kind of first started? Because even though, like you said, we, we can 
drink dip, different types of liquids, right? <laughs> okay. Right. Uh, I I love you and I love some Cardi and Meg yes. The Stallion is my yes. life coach, whether she knows it or not. Come on with it. <laughs> right? I just wish I had her knees. Just one of Yo, these knees. You and me both. <laughs> Good Lord. My, uh, but we can have a variety of music, but it did feel like there, whenever one female rapper is super successful, then they want to build a bunch of prototypes after that. Look that look like that, yes. That look like that. So mm-hmm. was there ever any pressure you either put on yourself or felt that when you started to become more successful that you had to change your image or try to fit a certain image? I never I never felt pressure in the need that I wanted to change or felt it from, you know, Jamla, my, uh, Knife, or Rock Nation or anyone. I never felt that pressure. Everybody just took me as I was and, and championed that. I think for the other side, my mind was more hurt because you see the comments of, of what you know social media makes, and if you if you allow yourself to fall into that, that can mess with your self love. So that's where it affected me. It was like, man, like I'm getting called ugly every other day, you know, and you know, sh- uh, people like to tell you what you, your sexually or sexual orientation is based on based on how you dress. It's like Maybe I just like to be comfortable, you know, and it's like all these things projected on you just because you don't look like the cookie cutter version of anybody else. So that's the thing that I had to deal with the most is just like, you know, you're not beautiful. You're not sexy. You know, uh, this is this is it's just like this is who you are based on how you look. And it's just like, man, like, how did we even get here? Like, you know, and it's sad to me is because y'all are so programmed to think like that. Like what people set out to do, they have done. If that's what you think, that's what you think when you look at other people. And that's what you think about yourself and beauty standards, you know, and too, like not only I I didn't even get it so much as much from men as I got it from women, too. I was going to say was I was going to ask you that because the one thing and, and Trina also talked about this is that women are the consumers of yes. of a lot of hip hop. Like yes. we're the ones buying it. Right. And so. Part of the reason why there are certain there are some of these artists have been so successful is because it's women projecting kind of that image. Mm-hmm. Um, this is gonna be a slight tangent, but it kind of relates. Like I was reading a story literally today. Um, uh, it was a story about Pornhub. I know you're like, where the hell is this going? But it was a story about Pornhub. And no, I don't always read about Pornhub. I'm a journalist, <laughs> damn it. I read all kind of shit. Okay, yes. but it was a story that about how on Pornhub. Uh, even though more men overall are on Pornhub, when they aggregated and looked at the searches of women, the women who are on Pornhub search the most violent sexual acts against women. Like one of their number one searches was like um, uh, sex that wasn't consensual. Right. And it was like, this are women, women searching this. That's, and that's that's crazy. <laughs> like I was watching a documentary too. You remember when I think it was Nelly went to, he went to some all girls school to perform in the South. And they they protested and boycotted because he had used like bitch and and thing and bitch and sexually explicit lyrics, and it was like, oh, you're degrading the women and sexes. But again, to your point, women are the biggest consumers of hip hop. So to that, that women are the ones that's buying it the most. So it's just like a double negative, like, and that's what was crazy to me. Like, you know, we talk about hip-hop where it causes bitches in this and yet we in the club we singing to it you know we buying it again you know to me it's like freedom of speech all (laughs) i want is balance at the end of the day but you know that was crazy to me like it's just like do we do we see that you know to be online and for another woman to call me ugly is amazing to me it's like word it's like you know, I don't want to listen to her. Like, she dressed like this. And I'm just like, yo, and tomorrow you're going to talk about how men sexualizing you. Like, what do you want? Right. What are we doing? And and that was like, that's has, still to my, still to this day, that's still the, the thing. Like, I'm trying to cipher it through, like, because I don't understand it. And I'm trying to feel, like, how do we get here? Like, well, they, um, it, it's a, it's an old adage that, those who are oppressed begin to take on the traits of the oppressor, that's a, right? That's, that's really, right. And that's so hard. I see it also um, just with our, our race as a whole is that nobody is harder on black people than black, black people, people. Mm-hmm. for sure. It's like I've had a couple conversations with people online, like white supremacy doesn't need your help. 
You don't need to carry their water, right? And so um, I feel the same way about other, you know, women. We can be really hard on each other. Mm -hmm. And that's one of many reasons why when your project, seeing the whole theme of it, this is long before I even knew my name was (laughs) was that, oh, man, um, there's never been anything kind of like that uh, that I've ever seen. So um, it's interesting that, you know, you have all these conversations about, uh, you know, you feeling kind of that rejection from some women. It certainly wasn't all women, but from right. some women uh, in the industry. Likewise, though, it seems like um, you are often cited. Because the other thing I hate to see, they always say, uh, my husband says this all the time, comparison is the thief of joy, yes. right? Yes, come on. I know where you go. You know, I'm going with this. On. It's like they now, so then it flips to where mm-hmm. they use you mm-hmm. to as, as, the person that they that they elevate and try to at the same time tear down Cardi B and make the stallion and they like Rhapsody is real hip hop it's like wait what <laughs> yo and I take the L's for that yeah. and I'm like like you were even, saying it it's like it right. ain't coming from you <laughs> no like I'm like yo I I show love to Cardi all the time but you got to be tuned in to me to even get that but yes I see that conversation especially on Twitter. You know, uh, women like, oh, y'all love to use Rhapsody as the scapegoat and put her on a pedestal. And it's just like, uh, how did I even get it? You're like, can this? I live? Yeah. Can I live? <laughs> and, I, and that goes back to the thing of, you know, why with women does it have to just be one? Like, I don't see a conversation to that degree. You might see it every now and again, but it's like, oh, Kendrick Lamar and J. Cole and Young Thug. Like, the guys are allowed to exist and be, you know, different and all support and show love or compete with each other in healthy ways. But when it comes to us, you know, it has to be, oh, you either on Rhapsody's end or you're on Cardi end or you got to be this, you got to be that. Like, why we just can't be women that just have different styles yeah. that people appreciate? You know what I'm saying? Like, I listen to all of it the same way as you. So, you know, it's it's always this fight and pit against one or the other. And I think it's it's just so lame because I think for us, me, Cardi, Megan, the KD forty seven, Tierra Wack, Chica, Tokyo Jets, we good with each other. It's it's everybody else that has the issue and it's just like Y'all bored? <laughs> like, <laughs> y'all, you know, like, you need something to do because you're creating all this false tension that y'all bring up. And for us, we all good. Yeah. All of us. Like, do you, what, do you feel like overall that for women, hip hop is in a healthy place for female artists? Yeah, I do. I think it's, I think it can always be better, but I think it's in a healthy place. It's getting better. Like, but you have to think of it outside of mainstream. Now, if you ask me on a mainstream side, like we just need more balance. It's still very one sided as far as, you know, what a female in hip hop looks like and what a female in hip hop sounds like and the stories that are told about women, especially black women, is very one sided. And it's a story now that, you know, people can relate to and true, but there are so many other stories that aren't told. Um, but it on in the culture of hip hop, if you if you're one that can look for music and you, you don't live on only TV and radio, I think it's super healthy because it's so diverse and it's there's so much talent. Um, you know, like I said, like I go to Afro Punk and I watch the Kaylee Forty Seven get down and she busting and the crowd is going nuts. You know, um, you go build Megan The Stallion's getting Billboard awards like. I'm doing, you know, my thing. So I think it's it's very balanced and, and in a very healthy place. But on a bigger mainstream level, it could be better for mm-hmm. sure. Well, I have so much more to talk to you about. I want to talk to you about your relationship uh, with Ninth because um, I was very impressed when I heard about the homework assignment that he gave you. Oh, the first time yeah. you met me. But don't tell it yet. Don't tell it yet. <laughs> okay. All right. And of course... <laughs> Um, you know, kind of your your those early days of you living in the studio, because um, mm-hmm. people need to know about your grind. You know, because everybody um, everybody doesn't always know the backstory. They think you were you were you know born a Grammy nominee. <laughs> it's like it right. doesn't it doesn't quite happen that way. You put in a lot of years, so we'll get to that in those early days and and what that process talk taught you. Um, but we're gonna take a quick break, real fast, and more with Rhapsody coming up. I love uh, asking hip hop artists this question in particular. Um, 
what was the song that made you fall in love with hip hop? Yo, that's crazy. I'm gonna be real. I don't have one. You don't have one? How what? is this possible? I got I got the one that made me want to rap. Okay. That's that's just as good. Oh, okay. That's just, yeah, that's good. just, just as good. Yeah. Poor Georgie by MC Light. That's the one. Really? Yeah. I don't I can't I was young though. Know, uh she was the first female that I saw before I found out there were others, but she was the first female I saw that was rapping. And I thought that was rapping just as good as the guys and like it was a storyteller joint, and I was just, you know, her style was ill. I was just in the TV like, what is this? I got to I gotta do it. <laughs> <laughs> so she was the first one, but yeah. Oh, wow. Cha-Cha-Cha was my song. Yeah. yeah. I think I knew that. I think yeah, I heard I like, you talk I, about it. That was my song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's to my this Mardi Gras, I'm the dopest female <laughs> that, that just heard this fall. Fall. And I, I get, do, a, I get I, the words wrong? No, you, I okay. think you got them right. Yeah, yeah. And I do get better... Something, something. I no, forgot I mean, what it is. It's been right, a minute since I heard this Yeah, yeah, yeah. Song. I got to refresh. <laughs> yeah. No, because I still remember her in that white trench. Yeah. Like, I think it was either white BMW or white Mercedes. <laughs> yeah, I'm that years old. <laughs> well, that's the one she pulled up to the subway and dropped out? Yes, I think yeah, that yeah, was yeah, the yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, yep. That was cold. That beat was out cold. Um, so you that was the one that made you want to become a rapper. But I imagine, especially being a woman... Saying, yeah, I want to be a rapper. I'm sure a lot of people probably looked at you like you had grown another head, you right? In North Carolina? In North Carolina, no up. doubt. I ain't tell nobody till I was in college. Yeah. You know, it was just like, oh, you're going to go. You know, in the South, it's doctor, lawyer, accountant, teacher. You know, that's, that's the profession that is accepted, that people want you to do. Um, or basketball, because I played basketball and... I just knew I was gonna go to the WNBA, not five three. Yeah, I was saying, <laughs> you've been a point guard. I Lada, she was my hero. She did it. Um, so, but you know, it would we'd be cleaning up like me and my brother. We'd be freestyling. He'd be like, "You whack." So you know, I just never told anybody like that was my dream, dream. And I got to college, um, and I got around the right friends and. I, I think when I got to college, I had been writing on the low, like writing poetry and transitioning into rap for maybe like three years. Um, I got around my friends. They were doing it actively, like in bands and having shows. And I would just always hang out with them, be in the studio with them. And um, I had a best friend, Alex, who's Charlie Smarts. That's his rap name. And um, I would tell, like, man, I want to rap. Like, yo, listen to this. I wrote this. Because he never judged me. He's so goofy. I just felt comfortable. Like, he know he goofy. I can say that. Um, so it was like, no matter how goofy I am, you can't pick on me but so much. <laughs> so, you know, um, so, you know, he knew. He was probably the only person that I told. Um, and we were in the studio one day. And he was just like, you know, won't you come? That, that, rap, that rap you wrote, just come record it. Like, we just having fun. Nobody here going to judge you. So I did it, and that was the start of it. Um, and I met Knife after that. Mm, but, so how did you meet Knife? Oh, man. Before I get to that, because okay. I, I had a thought. You know, like, you don't want to tell nobody you rap, but you want to give them a respectable prof profession that you want to be in. I was taking accounting, and... Um, I told my, I think I was home for the holidays. My cousin was over there. My mom, I was like, yo, I think I want to go to NYU and I want to take uh, entertainment marketing and I want to be a radio host, right? I was like, they'll accept that. And they was like, why you want to do that? And, da, da, da. and I just started crying for no reason. And they was like, why are you crying? And it, now I look back, it was just like, yo, because they was really, like, I just had this, it, I was so, I think it was fear. I was so afraid to say what I wanted. I just felt like I was going to get trapped in this life. <laughs> but Which how, is going to be somebody's accountant Oh, somewhere. my God, accountant <laughs> or just just doing something. Was that, that your I major at NC State? Yes. Oh. oh. I got my junior year. You know when you get your junior year, you take your core classes. And I was like, I do not want to do this like ever in life but I was in my junior year I was just like man I made it this far like I'm not switching now so but how I met knife mm -hmm. <laughs> um so the group that I was in be, be we we had started like a hip-hop organization so there were maybe like 20 people um and ours was open so either you you could even if you went to NC State or you didn't you could join the organization um, so we did a, a mixtape that summer, 
It's the first two songs I had written recorded because Charlie had gotten me in the booth at that time. So I put two songs on the mixtape. And one of the guys in the organization, um, Tom Fullery, was shadowing under Ninth, learning how to make beats. So, you know, he invited Ninth. He's like, yo, I got this group. Like, we did this mixtape. Can you just come speak to everybody, listen to the music? And if you know Ninth, like, if he has the time, any time, especially a student or somebody that wants to learn, ask him something like that, he will do it. He'll stand outside and talk to you for two hours. I've seen that. Like, um, So he came by. Uh, this was... 2005 it was right before minstrel show came out um but he had already done the black album he had already done uh breakthrough with mary j blige and i want to say he worked with destiny's child by this time as well um so he came by you know we were geeking off first and playing the threat beat he was playing some gene gray uh records genius that weren't out yet um, you know, telling us stories about Little Brother and just about hip hop. And then he started listening to our music. And I think mine was in the like number 15 in the mixtape. So I'm sitting in the back, like, I'm just like, yo, this dude is not like, he about to play my face. And I'm, it's, I'm just going to be mad discouraged. So he's playing all the records and he gets to mine and he listens for like two minutes and he's like, take it back again. And he doesn't. I'm just like, why is he torturing me in this way? Like, is he? Well, I, I'm I'm expecting him to be like, oh, you need to do this, and that's whack, and that's whack. He did that like three or four times, and then you know, out of everybody, and some people had been rhyming in there all their life. He said, "That's your star." And I, I wanted to throw up. I didn't know. <laughs> That's not the reaction I was expecting That's you to have. Yo, like when they, you know, when M say I had the sweaty palms and that was me, like my palms were sweating. I really like what I ate was in my throat. Like it was about to be done. Um, but that would have been pretty memorable. Oh, man. <laughs> Yo, but I got through it. <laughs> um, and then he's taking me, he took me under his wing after that. Like he didn't sign me right away, but like I would be at foot action where I worked and I might get a random call from Fullery. be like, yo, knife said, come to the studio. I'm out. Like thankful for my boss. I should have been fired 59 times straight up. Like there were days like I'd be work. I just wouldn't even come in like, <laughs> or I'd be like, yo, I got to go right now. Like, can I please go? And they would just let me go. Um, so, you know, even if we, he called us, it, it was just hanging out, watching him make beats. Or one time we went and I think they was working on some little brother stuff. But, you know, he had just allowed us to be around and soak up game and knowledge. And then he signed me four years after that. Wow. Yeah. So you were in that process for, for a little minute. Mm -hmm. um, so what was the homework assignment that he gave you? <laughs> yeah, that day. That yeah. day he heard those songs. Um, he, he gave me... 10 albums that I had to listen to because he said, you know, you your lyrics are there, but you have to learn about flow, um, how to flow on a beat. Because at the time, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking like, yo, this was a time, you know, everybody sound alike nowadays when they rap. This was a time like, I'm, I'm like the 90s kid. You don't want to sound like nobody. So I'm just trying to think of all the different ways you could rhyme and it's just falling all off beat and all of that. So I got to I gotta tighten that up. So he gave me 10 albums and he told me, don't listen to what they're saying, but listen to how they're saying it. You know, where they breathe that, uh, inflections, you know, how the words fall on a beat. Do they come in on a one, they come in on a two, you know, just to, you know, how they connect their bars, you know, the if you know poetry, you can have poetry, and they they it could rhyme a b b a, a b a b a a a a b b b like you know just picking up those little nuances. So he, he gave me ten. I can only remember three that he gave me because <laughs> those are probably the only three I listened to. Um, one was Jay Z's The Black Album, um, Tribe Called Quest, Midnight Marauders, and Low End Theory. He gave me uh, Doggy Style too. But there were some others I I can't remember. But the Black Album is the one I played the most because I'm a Jay-Z fan. Like, I used to get up and get in the shower. And part of my routine was I would, <laughs> till the water got cold, I would uh, recite that album from the intro to the last song, word for word. I always thought it was it was really underrated. Um, yes. It, like, Allure is still one of my favorite songs that he's ever oh my, done. Yeah, Without a doubt, yeah. like... It's still pretty, What's it's your, still bang. I, I mean, this is, 
it's off topic, but your top three J albums, I just gotta know. Um, Reasonable Doubt is gonna always be my favorite. <laughs> my girl, it is. I mean, look, it. I was listening to it maybe like last week, and I was like, I just, Yo. it's amazing how there are some things that don't age well because I think there are other artists who have come out with material and it's like, man, that just don't hit the same, no, right? right? His hits differently, almost harder now than it did than it did back in 95. I think that's when it came out. So that, um, the Black Album, and I'm going to say 444 because um, to me that's him putting together. And look, I could easily go Blueprint, mm -hmm. but it's to me that's him putting it all together like this is the grownness of jay-z the that's evolution grown, that's grown man. super grown material and getting. open and honest yes very right. open and honest so i'm just you know i don't think when he came out in 95 i would have imagined that he would be married to somebody like beyonce have a bunch <laughs> of kids and it's like oh my god he officially is like America's uncle right now, <laughs> you know but in a uncle good way jay. yeah yeah because i was watching um you know, I was watching, uh, uh, I think it was on, I don't remember what network it was on, but it was a love story of Faith and Biggie. Um, oh, on Lifetime. Lifetime. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very, it was really good. But one of the things Biggie said that was crazy, he was like, he didn't want to be rapping at 34. And I'm looking at a lot of the rappers wow. now, and they're all well in their 30s. Some of them starting at 34. <laughs> exactly. Or <laughs> well into their 30s or in their 40s. Like, right. Jay-Z could do this a long time. <laughs> he can do it like Coach K, Coach Basketball on Same. the grill. Um, I know your time is running short, but before <laughs> I get you out of here, I know the good time has to come to an end. I wanted to ask you about somebody who I know meant a lot to you, Mac Miller. And his first single, Following His Death, Good News, um, was released. Um, you know, it, it seems like, unfortunately, between him, Juice World, um, that there is... I don't know, it's just because obviously they're famous, more well-known, but there's an underlying problem there in hip-hop. And I, I get it. Drugs, rock and roll, has been together forever. But do you feel like as somebody in the industry who can, you know, sort of testify to this, but do you feel like there is a larger problem of drug addiction in hip-hop? We're seeing these young people lose their lives. Yeah, definitely. Um, to The, the hip-hop that we grew up on, you know, it was a time where it was it was cool to be the drug dealer but never the drug user. That was never cool. And the drugs that they did in rock and roll, we did not do in hip hop. And it's become this thing where it's like making hip hop rock and roll and like I'm saying, like consuming, you know, these pills and these, you know, just super out of the ordinary other than weed drugs. Right. <laughs> People do crack, but crack ain't never killed nobody that I know of. <laughs> I'm not condoning it, none of that, um, you know, but not even to make, make light of the situation, but it, it definitely is a problem, um, you know, I, know I, I, I like Future's artistry, but, you know, the generation of kids that his music has affected, mainly Juice World, you know, talking about, you know, Lean and, you know, even Wayne and, you know, I can't judge anybody, but at the same time, with great reward comes great responsibility. And you have to understand that though this may be a life, the people that are looking at you, and even if you continue to do it, at least put out the message where, you know, I don't suggest you doing this in middle school. You right. know what I mean? Like, that's that's hard to look back and and I can only understand. I'm not going to imagine how that feels to look back and know that, yo, my music affected this kid. And now look what happened. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? And, you know, some people may not. It's not, you know, the responsibility completely of the artist because you got parents too. But we have to understand the influence of music. Like, you can't take that lightly. Like, this microphone is super powerful. Um, so it it is, you know, a, a, a super problem to me because, again, like, even if they do it, they don't even – provide balance and clarity you know and I think that's the biggest thing and just you know manning up and being honest about yo if you do this though understand like this might this might happen so I just think that's something that we can we can do better at and be more aware of and again not not to be judgmental but that's just being honest mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying so um we will end on a fun note it's a little game I like to play with uh, my guests and because I like you especially so much I made it especially hard for you. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Just because I like you so much. Okay. I love you too, Jay. <laughs> the game is called This or That. 
You get two choices. You got to pick one. Don't punk out. How quick? It's, it's got to be rapid fire. It's rapid fire. Okay? All so right. super quick. First, I ain't even going to blink. Don't blink. Let's do it. Okay. Biscuits or cornbread? Ooh, cornbread. <laughs> <laughs> Outcast or UGK? Outcast. Low End Theory or Midnight Marauders? Midnight Marauders. 444 four, four, Lemonade? 444. Four, four. Song Cry or 99 Problems? <laughs> Song Cry. <laughs> Lil' Kim or Foxy Brown? Oh, come on. Kim. And finally, for no bonus points whatsoever, for just the sake of your reputation and the fate of humanity, perhaps. Oh, my God. Doggy style or chronic? Yo, come Okay. Chronic, because there would be no doggy style without chronic. See, I, I love how you feel like you have to put that explanation on it. You're like, it's because it came <laughs> first. And so, Yo, therefore. <laughs> exactly. You know. If, yeah. Yeah. Ooh. Okay. Good answer. You you breeze through Ooh, that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I, you, were, you were intently Give me a bonus focused. one. Give me a bonus. Uh, I'm feeling nice. No, nah, no. Nah, because <laughs> then you're going to help people out there might be watching. Like, okay, that's the trick to go fast. Like, no. Nah. <laughs> Um, well, look, thank you so much for joining me. I know that you are busy as hell. Um, thank you. You're going on tour soon, right? A Black Woman yes, Created This Tour? Yes, a Black Woman Created This Tour kicks off February 4th in New York, I think. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that sounds right. We'll go yeah, with that. Yeah, that sounds right. Well, I know it's going to be amazing. And um, yeah, I mean, man, fuck the Grammys. They don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> you said it, not <laughs> that's me. Right. You, that's right. I'm, I'm being uh, taken to uh, Drake's position here. That's generally his disposition or whatever. So... Um, but no, I was just happy to sit down and talk to you. Uh, we've never had an opportunity to really sit down and, and talk. No, so I just thank you. Um, thank you just for not just what you meant to music, but just the example you're just showing black women everywhere, regardless of what your field is. It really is very inspiring um, to see because, you know, look, we say Wakanda. All right. <laughs> we got the world. We, we allegedly going to save this election <laughs> in 2020. Uh, yes. <laughs> we got that on our shoulders. So. <laughs> It's nice that somebody out there uh, appreciates the versatility and the whole spectrum of black women. So thank, thank you for that. Thank you. All right. I'm just a reflection of all the black women that are in my life. You being one. So. Uh, well, I, I accept and receive it. Come um, on with it, sister. <laughs> well, Rhapsody is getting out of here. I'm sticking around. Y'all know what's coming up next. Fuck it. I'm bothered. <laughs> uh. <laughs>